Yeah, thank you very much for the possibility to be here. And indeed, my talk about uh, randomness. and hyperbolicity. In particular, it involves random walks, that subject that uh, Vadim Kaimanovich said yesterday about. So I again, random walks. On groups. So again, I need some countable group. and some measure, probability measure, on this group. And we're considering just sequences of H1, H2, H3, and so on, of uh, independent, identically distributed, mu distributed random variables, and then see on the behavior of sequences like H1, then product H1, H2, H1, H2, H3, and so on. So if you didn't know, don't know anything about random walk, just uh, recall something like a brown in motion. Yeah? So brown in motion when you have a particle that moves randomly in some area and uh, it can be modeled on the on case when g is uh, within power 3, say. And let's consider uh, power 2 for simplicity. Uh, if you scale the thing down, this is the Kelly graph of our group, and if you consider the simple random walk, when each other step goes to the nearest point, then if we see at the picture from the uh, big distance, we see something like Brownian motion, yes? And now if you have some arbitrary group, countable group, just uh, imagine that you have some space Maybe you don't know the properties of this space, but you are interested in the Brownian motion of little particle inside this space. Yeah? And the, we are, first of all, we're interested in a simple uh, question, the behavior of this random particle, maybe it goes to infinity somewhere or it, it returns, something like that. And, uh, here appears the connection with hyperbolicity because uh, hyperbolic spaces is provide us with the case when we can uh, say some answers on the simplest questions. So let me formulate some theorem. Let um, H be a grom of hyperbolic space. Now let it be proper, uh, which means that uh, each metric closed ball is really closed, compact. Each such ball is compact in our space. Yeah? And suppose that our group acts on H by isometries. And then we have our measure, and uh, that we have some non degeneracy conditions. For example, uh, with this random walk, random walk guided by mu, we can go in any element of the group and uh, let the each point in our space, the orbit will be unbounded 
and maybe some other non-generous condition. For example, um, let if we have uh, an action by isometries on hyperbolic space, then we have the induced action on the boundary of this space. Yeah. Uh, let I ask that uh, we have no finite orbits on this boundary. And then we can say a lot about the behavior of these uh, sample paths of this our Brownian motion. For example, uh, first, for any point of our space, uh, if we have such a random sequence, then with probability one, there exists a limit uh, say omega in the boundary such that uh, the sequence tends to this point on the boundary Let's consider some example. If we have just a uh, hyperbolic plane as our space and our hyperbolic boundary is just the absolute, yeah? then imagine some uh, group acting here by isometries. For example, the free group that uh, one generator shifts the thing to the right and another one shifts the thing up. What will happen? And if we uh, take some random sequence of shifts, yeah? For example, this corresponds to the first shift, yeah? Then we have second one. This is our first point. Then we have, when we apply the second, say it be like that. Then first we have another point and so on. And the theorem says that we have the limit. This uh, sequence will go to some points on the some point on the boundary. Yeah. The theorem is obvious for the tree. Yes. No, no. Even for the tree, it's not true. No, for the tree, it's not true. You will not have any point if you, if your measure is symmetric. You will not have any point on the boundary at infinity such that the sequence goes to this point. This one? Three. Three. Ah, three. Yes, of course. If we have three, for three it's true. Yeah. For three it's almost obvious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the same, which is uh, almost obvious for three, really uh, true for any hyperbolic space. If we have some non degeneracy conditions, then it's true. But um, of course, this is uh, the, the case is not a billion, so we should uh, carefully uh, choose the order in which we apply our random <laughs> things. Because um, if we apply in it in another way, let's consider h1 of x, then h1, h2. In this sequence, the thing will go and jump all over the place. In fact, we can formulate it as uh, this is random ergodic theorem. But we need a little bit another sequence. Uh, when our point jumps all over the place, let's consider 
uh, the average of this first first uh, 10 points 100 points and so on and at each step instead of the set of points consider a measure concentrated at these points for example uh, Dirac delta measure at h1 of x then uh, on the next step the sum of two measures divided by two and so on then this sequence of measures will weakly converge to some measure concentrated on the boundary some measure new uh, with support on, on this boundary so in the non-abelian case we have completely different behavior here in, fir in the first case the sequence of points goes to the point at infinity and the second case it doesn't and we have these averaging measures and these measures converge to some measure at infinity yeah hmm? yeah it doesn't depend on the choice of the sequence with probability one there exists a measure new such that uh, for almost each sequence of independent random variables the limit will be this measure new but it depends on the starting point no doesn't? no in fact um, it doesn't depend in, instead of point you can take any measure uh, even not in on H, any measure, Borel probability measure, on this union. Yeah? And then, instead of these things, you consider of this lambda, then you consider this sum. This is the same for lambda, yeah? One for lambda. And so on. And this sequence will go to this the same new for any measure. What is the action of the group ergodic on the boundary with this mirror? Yes. Yes. It's, it will be uh, a mu stationary measure, the unique mu stationary measure on the boundary, and the action is ergodic. Yeah. Mm. First, you stated a general theorem that there is a limit, right? Yeah. And then you gave the example number two that there is no limit, but rather a example. Yeah. The limit because of the order, the order of we multiply our random elements. This one h1 and then goes h2, it's applied first to x, then goes h1, h2, h3, and h3 applied first to x, then 2 and 1. And then we change the order. These are two distinct statements. So in the first case, when the order like that, the point will go to some limit point at infinity. Mm -hmm. And in the second case, it will jump all over the boundary, near the boundary. And the limit, we have limit only if we uh, implement the uh, random ergodic theorem. We need this average in this case. It's meaning that uh, it, there is no uh, limit. There is no limit. And to describe this distribution. Hmm? But you don't claim they are equidistributed. No, no, no. There is some measure. Some measure. As Vadim said yesterday, if you take some 
I think like a free group, this measure will be singular with respect to the usual Lebesgue measure here. Yeah, it's like non-degeneracy conditions. If, if we take something degenerate, for example, the measure mu concentrated, say, on some element unique of the group, then this. Yeah. And properness here. And you see that in this uh, case two, yeah. And we see the other uh, order, we can involve the points on the boundary. Yeah? In the first case, this is true only for the points of the space itself. And in the second case, when the order reversed, this is true for all points, but in the weaker sense, in the weak sense. And in fact, we can say something like that. Uh, for the points of the boundary in the first case with this order. Yeah? But in this case, uh, we know that for hyperbolic spaces, so suppose we have a sequence, yeah? H1, H2, and so on, and we implement it in this order, like in case one. And now instead of the point x here inside the space, Let's consider the point x on the boundary. Yeah? Then the behavior here will be something like that. The point, the point will uh, almost converge to some point, but sometimes it will jump away. Very interesting behavior. But still, uh, we can formulate some uh, convergence statement for this case. If our point, so this is x, then we have h1 x, then we have h1 h2 x, then suddenly we have something like that. h1 h2 h3 x lying somewhere there. Then the next one, h1 h2 h3 h4, again here converging to some point. Yeah? Sometimes this point will jump away, but almost surely it will return here. So we have now the convergence theorem for points, but we have convergence theorem for measures. If we consider again such a sequence of this kind, but for this order in this case. Yeah? Uh, now I take x from the boundary. I have now this convergence, but I use this type of convergence. And the sequence now h uh, delta measure at h1 of x, then the second element is delta measure of h1 of x and now in this order plus delta h1 h2 of x divided by 2 and so on. Yeah? Again, instead of points, I am considering averaging of measures. Yeah? Then I again will obtain convergence to the same point as here in First statement. Yeah. Now, uh, so the the sense is that in hyperbolic, in the case when our group act on some hyperbolic space, uh, we know the simplest facts about the behavior of our random walk. And what I'm talking about is that um, there are a, a lot of uh, research about uh, extending these results for other cases. So it's like some uh, sample core behavior. 
we would like to see uh, it usually for various spaces we see that the behavior almost like that if we have a point of the space and uh, consider the random walk usually the point goes to some if we uh, implement in such order our elements usually the point goes to some point in infinity and if we implement the elements in another order then we have some limit measure at infinity but we can't prove it, prove it usually so uh, let's consider the uh, question of generalization of this theorem we have uh, the case of when group acts on hyperbolic space proper and we want to generalize it somewhere else for example uh, we can consider still isometric actions on some uh, spaces similar to hyperbolic yeah hyperbolic like A lot of results in this direction. For example, um, Vadim Kaimanoj has a paper random walks on groups with hyperbolic properties. Then we have another generalization of the case when uh, we act on some hyperbolic space which is non proper. In fact, a lot of interesting groups that are similar to hyperbolic groups in fact not just similar to hyperbolic groups in fact they act on some hyperbolic space which is not proper for example mapping class groups acts on terrible hyperbolic spaces the spaces of curves which are really hyperbolic but not proper the group of, of automorphisms of uh, the free group act on some hyperbolic space which is not proper a lot of interesting groups in fact uh, act on some hyperbolic spaces which are very strange so and in this case we have a result of Maher saying that this theorem can be generalized there we can forget about properness in fact always Always. We need something like uh, that it be separable instead. And now I, I want to say some new results about the thing when we uh, consider another generalization. Instead of considering uh, groups acting by isometries on some spaces that generalizes generalized hyperbolic ones let's consider the case when we consider the action on hyperbolic spaces but not as a metric action so in this case first of all uh, of course we can consider the quasi isometries and the second thing I will discuss here is the action by uh, any homeomorphisms yeah. and here I have two theorems the first one no it's just any countable group yeah So suppose first for quasi isometries, yeah. But I, I have now here some general result, but I have very special result like that. Uh, suppose we have a group countable with a normal hyperbolic subgroup. then 
my group act on this subgroup by conjugation here. Yeah? For each element, I have the map that sends H to, since the subgroup is normal, we are again inside it. Hmm? Um, H is I from which, uh, it doesn't matter. Just hyperbolic subgroup. Grom of hyperbolic subgroup. And let, let the, all the things be finitely generated and this also finitely generated groups. It doesn't matter. If you have uh, finitely generated groups and finitely generated subgroup, all your uh, matrix, all your finite word matrix are equivalent to quasi isometricity. Take any. You can take, uh, when you consider. He's saying that the group as an after group is finitely generated and is uh, word hyperbolic, right? Yes. yes. Our first group is just finitely generated. And our subgroup is finitely generated, hyperbolic and normal. G is not. Mm. Then we have an action of our group on this hyperbolic space. And we have an action on the boundary of this space, because when we act by quasi isometries, we still have an action on the boundary when our uh, hyperbolic space is proper. Yeah? It turns out that in this case, of course, we have no convergence of points. For example, if we take a trivial element, we see that this is fixed by any, it doesn't move. But it turns out that that theorem I formulated here will work on the boundary. So for the boundary, we will have uh, the same thing, not convergence of points, but convergence of uh, measures. So if we take a point here on the boundary, then for almost every sequence of elements in our group, this sequence delta measure at uh, g1 of omega, then sum of delta measures And so on, this sequence will converge. Yet another thing about homeomorphisms. So in general, of course, if we have this case, if instead of uh, isometries or quasi-isometries, we consider homeomorphisms, we, of course, we will obtain nothing. It's too, too large thing some homeomorphism. But if our uh, space we consider is very special, for example, let it be some tree, or maybe even an R tree. That is the zero hyperbolic groom of space, yeah? Uh, Anybody know what it R3 is? This is something like that, and this is uh, the most nice hyperbolic space. And between any two points, you can go like this, but it's not the usual tree, but tree where the things can uh, grow out of any point. You see? Yeah? So usual trees 
are concrete examples, but we can consider any such trees. And suppose our group act on this case. And in this case, we can consider, it turns out, that any action, not the action by isometries, but any action by homeomorphisms. No, we can consider something like, uh, let it be like real line, and you can take uh, new real lines from uh, all rational points, say, yeah? And in this arrays, you can take new lines in all rational points. This thing will have a lot of homeomorphisms which are not uh, isometries. And for this case, we also can extend our theorem about convergence. Yeah. Which are not Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Our group G acts on uh, R3 T, yeah? Uh, and of course, we need some non degenerate So let mu generate all the group, support of mu generates all the group, and let uh, by homeomorphism. And suppose that uh, there is no um, invariant subtrees yeah? for non-degeneracy. No invariant subtrees, no uh, finite orbits, no finite orbits at infinity, everything non-degenerate. Yeah? Then, hmm? Yeah, we don't, yeah, because we have only two points at infinity, we need infinite number, we need no fixed points. Which line you Stabilizer of the line is very, very, very poor, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but usually if we have some action, yeah, you have an invariant Subtree, you can consider the action of the, on this subtree instead. Uh, what? No. Uh, you ask, there is no uh, finite orbits of, on, on the boundary. Yeah? yeah. No finite orbits on the boundary. That's what's called non elementary. Yeah. Then, uh, to state the theorem, first of all, let uh, change the topology. Yeah? If you have some R3, uh, in fact, you can have something uh, non-compact uh, and not compactifiable. For example, if you take something like that, an infinite number of rays from a point. This is neither compact nor can be compactified by adding the points at infinity. Yeah? So we should change our uh, topology a little bit to formulate the theorem. Uh, instead of this, we can consider the, sa the thing with the same uh, combinatorial uh, properties but shorten some rays. Yeah? Instead of this thing where all the rays is infinite, consider the thing where rays are like this. This is again an R3, and we even have a continuous map from here to there. Yeah? And this thing maybe can be compactified by adding the points at infinity. And 
uh, each homeomorphism of this thing extends to homeomorphism of this thing. So this tree is the same tree with slightly weakened topology. So for any uh, separable R tree, we can weaken topology to obtain uh, a compact space after adding the points on infinity. And our initial action will induce the action on this new R tree. Yeah? I need this thing to, uh, to formulate the convergence. Some uh, sequences will not converge here, but will uh, become convergent here. Yeah? It's very easy. Very easy. You see, just you, you didn't, you don't need to shorten rays. Just change the rays. Doesn't matter which rays are. Profile. Cofine. I will explain the procedure another way. Suppose you have some R three. Yeah. You know that for each point. If you uh, take it out, the components of the space will be open. Yeah? Now consider on this initial tree the new topology, which is generated by, by all the subset of this form that can be obtained by deleting some point and these components. In, in, in the initial tree, all these components were uh, open set, sets. Yeah? So if you consider something generated, some topology generated by these subsets, you will have something with the weaker topology. Yeah? This thing with the weaker topology will always be, again, metrizable as an R tree. So you, you, you don't need to shorten the rays. Just consider the new weakened topology with this simple definition. So instead of action on initial R3, now you have an action on this new R3. And in this action, we have the same theorems. Uh, for any point, but not uh, end point, inner point, for any inner point x, let T prime be my new R3. Yeah? For any point is this in this my uh, new R3. And with probability one, my sequence and so on will converge to some point of this my new R3. The difference is that uh, this limit point may be not an end point. Maybe this will be an inner point, because this is a little bit strange space. And again, we have, if we change the order, again we have the random ergodic theorem, and we have some limit measure on this thing. But again, in this case, this limit measure may be concentrated not on the set of endpoints. It can be concentrated on the set of inner points. Since this uh, measure is ergodic, it is concentrated either on the set of endpoints or on the set of inner points. But it always exists. Yeah. Yeah. On the boundary, you can speak 
can say, say something about religion. Mm. No, maybe I will. Well, maybe I will. Mm. Usually it uh, looks like the same trees, but the boundaries are the same. You slightly change the topology, but the set of endpoints didn't change. Yeah? So, did I have some more time? Ah. Okay, then I tell you about uh, another idea related to this one. Um, about the genericity of hyperbolic objects. Yeah? So, you see, why these uh, generalizations are so interesting? Because we can apply it to very many groups. We have a lot of groups that are similar to hyperbolic ones. In fact, um, if we consider the random walk in the set of all groups with some special rule to choose the groups. Yeah? It can be proved that uh, a generic group is hyperbolic. Yeah? It's all the results of Gromov, Falshansky, and so on. Just consider the sets of Yeah, you, you can fix some free group, fix a free group. You measure almost all group are free, and you maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's imprecise, you can formulate it in. Number of relations and number of. Yeah, but it's that most groups are not a project with this. Only groups in the middle of the world. I think I'm going to do presentations, but. Yeah, it can, it can be formulated precisely. Take some free group, yeah? And take... The, ah, yeah, okay. Then let just uh, be uh, some... I will list some sp uh, cases when we can uh, prove with some point of view that something is generic objects are hyperbolic, yeah? And there are the list when generic objects are not hyperbolic for groups we have an example when we can generate uh, groups and uh, asymptotically all groups will be hyperbolic yeah then for random walks we have a lot of examples um, take a mapping class group and consider any random walk there and in mapping class group we have uh, periodic elements reducible elements and pseudo anosov elements which are like hyperbolic yeah there are, uh, several papers where people prove that uh, the generic elements are pseudo anosov so mm, pseudo anosov elements hmm? yeah but they are like uh, elements of mapping class groups. So here, groups, then uh, automorphisms of surfaces. Yeah. Yeah, but you said that they are hyperbolic, but uh, it's an notion of hyperbolicity. Yeah. Now I so just really calling hyperbo uh, pseudo honors of elements. Let let it be for a moment hyperbolic elements. Yeah. Okay, laxodromic. Laxodromic. Yeah. So they are here, in this list, not there. Yeah? Uh, then we can uh, consider the various ways to, uh, say, construct um, three-dimensional manifolds. Yeah? For example, uh, we can consider Higgard splitting in if you fix two uh, handle bodies. Then we can take random walk uh, in the mapping class group and then glue this to handle bodies where asymptotically we will obtain more and more hyperbolic uh, 
manifolds. So it's the result of Marhel. Yeah? We can uh, consider something like, say, Dan feelings. Yeah? If we have some hyperbolic manifold and we take some knot inside, then we cut it out and turn it, cut it back, then all except finite, uh, we have uh, an infinite number of ways to glue it back. Yeah? All except a finite number of ways will give us hyperbolic manifolds. Yeah? So usually in this way, three manifolds with 10 fillings, then surgeries, again, usually they are hyperbolic things. And so on. We can uh, consider mapping toruses. Again, we will obtain usually hyperbolic things here. Yeah? A lot of them here. And uh, there is a problem here. You didn't see anything non hyperbolic. Almost a unique example when we can uh, prove that some uh, natural process give something non-hyperbolic is random walks in usual space and constructing nodes. If we consider uh, suppose we are in R3 and uh, we're considering some random walk there. Yeah? Uh, going, going, going. At some step, step, let us just connect initial and final points. We can obtain some knot. It is proved in various settings and uh, asymptotically you will obtain non-hyperbolic composite knot. Hmm? Asymptotically, it will be zero, yeah, non trivial. It's usually non trivial. Because asymptotically, if you consider it from the large distance away, uh, your walk is like that. You have some small node, then you go, go again, small node, and in some cases, you never return to this place. So these nodes will stand there forever. But these guys who like hyperbolic things, ask us, OK, you're considering this way to generate nodes. All nodes you obtain are uh, composite. Yeah? But consider the slice of uh, prime nodes. Let me remind you a minute the uh, classification of nodes. Yeah? We have if you have two nodes, we can consider the operation of connected sum. Yeah? You place them apart, take uh, things here, rip this there, and take the new node. If that was the node K1, this K2, then the result usually denoted like that. Connected sum. It this doesn't depend on the place where we remove small, small piece. No, it doesn't depend on the place. But uh, changing the orientation, we can uh, maybe obtain two such nodes. Least. But the place didn't, dep on the, it didn't depend. So, and. So, the, we have now the definition prime nodes. Uh, suppose we have a knot, and suppose that each time when we uh, present it in this way as a connected sum of two other knots, some of these knots should be trivial. Yeah? Then the name for such a knot is a prime knot. It can't be decomposed into two non-trivial knots. This is the theorem of Schubert that uh, each knot can be uniquely decomposed 
in the sum of some prime nodes. For each node k, there exist prime nodes p1, p2, and so on. I that k is the connected sum. And so on. So these nodes are prime nodes that can be decomposed further. Yeah? And uh, to proceed our classification, now recall that we have prime nodes, we have composite nodes, and yet we have uh, another classification. Each node is either hyperbolic, either satellite, or uh, torus node. Yeah? Not as torus node, it, it's, it, it can be placed on the surface on, on the torus. It's hyperbolic if uh, its complement can be endowed with the hyperbolic structure, and the, all of the other nodes are satellite nodes. Yeah? In particular, because they can be constructed uh, from other nodes, take uh, some node. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. It has a, an incompressible knotted torus in the complement. So this knotted torus is the companion, or maybe vice versa. So, so if you iterate torus nodes, they become companion nodes, right? So they are not torus nodes. Yeah. It's cable nodes. So, and we have this. Uh, composite nodes, they all are satellites. Yeah? We have no composite torus nodes, we have no uh, composite hyperbolic nodes. All composite nodes are by definition satellites. And if we consider prime nodes, then we have a question about whether it's hyperbolic or not. So when we have this example with uh, random walks and saying that all oh, here we win. Here we, who like non-hyperbolicity, we win. Here all our nodes are composite. That guys who like hyperbolicity said us, oh, that's not fair. You consider only composite nodes. Consider prime nodes. Then inside the prime nodes, you can compare the number of hyperbolic and the number of other nodes. Uh, and, uh, there is a conjecture that these guys are win because Which guy? that guys who likes hyperbolicity. <laughs> yeah, because we have such a table for the number of prime nodes. If we classify the prime nodes by the number of crossings, the number of crossings for each node we can we draw nodes. Uh, with the help of diagrams, for each node we can choose the diagram with minimal number of crossing. Yeah, and we uh, then we count the number for uh, diagrams with number of crossings three. Yeah, let's compute the number of hyperbolic, toric, and uh, satellite nodes. Then we have this picture. Uh, let it be table when I put the numbers of nodes. This will be uh, hyperbolic prime nodes. This will be satellite nodes and torus nodes. Yeah? That have diagram with 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on crossings. Yeah? Now we have number until 16. Here we have. Uh, yeah, yeah. The first node with three crossings is torus node. Yeah. Then we have first hyperbolic node with four crossings. We have only one. It's hyperbolic. Yeah. It's hyperbolic. Then we have one zero one. Then we have. 300, zero, zero. and then uh, the number of 
hyperbolic knots uh, grows drastically. And here, when we have 16, we have 1,388,705 hyperbolic knots, uh, 10 satellite knots, and one torus knot. So in fact, here we can easily put it 622. Here we have 1, 2, 1, 1, and almost all here are zeros. So out of the first 2 million prime nodes, we have only 20 non-hyperbolic nodes. So these guys who like hyperbolicity uh, have this conjecture. If I uh, denote by Hn the number of hyperbolic knots with n crossings, and if I deny, denote by Pn the number of hyperbolic knots of prime knots with n, that will be n or smaller crossings, yeah? Conjecture that uh, Hn divided by Pn goes to 1 as n goes to infinity, and the argument is that h uh, 16 divided by uh, p 16 is uh, approximately 2 millions divided by 2 millions and 20. Yeah. So they think that this thing goes to 1. And uh, at some point, and I'm trying to, uh, after studying the random walks in groups, I'm trying to understand maybe random walks can help to prove this conjecture. And I discovered that it's not true. Uh, but I can't prove that. But I can prove another theorem uh, like that. In the uh, not theory, there are several old conjectures. This conjecture is uh, 30 years old. Yeah? And there are some conjectures, for example, conjecture of uh, crossing number and additivity is 100 years old. This conjecture says that the crossing number is for each knot type. We have the minimal number of crossings. We need to construct a diagram for this knot. Yeah? Conjecture says that uh, if we have a sum of two knots, then the crossing number of this sum equals the sum of crossing numbers. Yeah? It's obvious that this is like that, and conjecture that it's equal. And uh, theorem is conjecture one which is 30 years old, contradicts conjecture 2, which is 100 years old. So it's wrong. It's wrong. Yeah. yeah, but we have another conjecture. <laughs> That'll be conjecture 3. Conjecture 3 says that crossing number of this guy is at least the crossing number of K1. This is very plausible, yeah? OK, in some books, guys, people write that, of course, it's true. Of course, it's true. We it just, it's, uh, we have no um, right techniques to do that. But we're sure that it's true. And we have the theorem that uh, conjecture one about hyperpolicity contradicts conjecture three. Yeah. And 
In fact, we have conjecture four that said that the crossing number of this guy is greater than two thirds of k1. Uh, conjecture one contradicts conjecture four. Now maybe you're on the other side, no? Maybe conjecture one is wrong. No? Okay, I have conjecture five for you. <laughs> conjecture five said that uh, it's more uh, long. I have some conjecture five says that uh, um, let us say that if for some knot we have uh, k one. crossing number k1. If for any k2 this holds, let us say that k1 is two-third regular, yeah? So this conjecture 4 says that all knots are two-thirds regular. Conjecture 5, suppose that uh, there exists some Epsilon and N such that uh, out of all prime hyperbolic knots with N crossings, at least part of size Epsilon is uh, two thirds regular knots. Not all of them regular. Let be some small part regular. Yeah? This is conjecture. Uh, let, uh, let H N be the number of hyperbolic knots with N crossings. Yeah? And L, let R R N be the number of two-thirds regular hyperbolic knots with n crossings. Conjecture is that there exist epsilon and n such that Rn is bigger than small part of Hn for all n large enough. Suppose we have uh, some small number of these nice knots. Not all knots nice. Let it some small number of knots nice. This conjecture 5 still contradicts conjecture 1. Nobody ever saw uh, the knots that the crossing number of them is smaller than the sum of crossing numbers. Uh, so these conjectures seems very plausible. And all of them contradicts conjecture one. So maybe this is the example where hyperbolicity doesn't work at last. Because all other examples we have and the hyperbolic objects pervasive. Only notes is our hope. <laughs> I think that's all. It's out of time. <laughs>